Good morning. Can anybody hear me? Okay. I think everything he said is probably true except for that last part. But I'm really excited to be here today. Today I'm going to be talking a little bit about the deep science of ultimate human performance, which is a subject that has fascinated me both personally and professionally for the better portion of two decades. And I want to start out by telling you how I first stumbled upon this subject and why it is quite literally the only reason I'm standing here today. That's not working. So when I was roughly 30 years old, I got Lyme disease. I spent the better portion of three years in bed. For those of you who don't know what Lyme disease is, it's sort of a cross between the worst flu you've ever had and paranoid schizophrenia. My physical function was massively, massively reduced. I was in so much pain, I could barely walk across a room. My mental function was totally gone. I couldn't read, I couldn't spell, I became dyslexic, I was hallucinating. My memory was so shot that I couldn't write anymore because I couldn't remember what I had written at the beginning of a sentence by the time I got to the end of the sentence. After a couple of years of this, the doctors had to pull me off drugs because my stomach lining started bleeding out and there was nothing else anybody could do for me. And in the middle of all of this, at about the worst point, I was extremely suicidal. This wasn't really because I'm a depressive person, it was because there was nothing else anybody could do for me and I was literally capable of functionality for about 10% of the day. I was awake and able to walk around for maybe a half an hour and that was no way to live. So I had a bottle of sleeping pills, some booze, and it really wasn't a question of if, it was mostly a question of when. And in the middle of all of this, a friend of mine showed up at my front door and demanded that we go surfing. This was a fairly ridiculous quest request, and not just for the obvious reasons. Obviously, I couldn't walk across a room, so surfing was going to be difficult. But about six years prior to this, I had nearly drowned in a big wave accident in Indonesia, and I had no intention of ever getting back on a surfboard again. But she was really, 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 really insistent. She was basically a pain in my butt. And I kind of figured, you know what? I can always kill myself tomorrow. Today, we're going to try to go surfing. So they drove me to the beach, and they, they had to walk me out to the, to the break, actually. It was a low tide day, so that was possible. And it was a beach known as Sunset Beach in Los Angeles, which any of you surf know is probably the wimpiest beginner wave in the world, which was just fine for me. They gave me a board the size of a Cadillac, and in surfing, the bigger the board, the easier it is to surf. And I was out there sitting on this board about 30 seconds, and a wave came. And I don't quite know what happened. Maybe muscle memory took over, maybe it was divine intervention. But I spun my board around, I paddled a couple times, and I jumped up onto it, and I literally leaped up into another dimension. Not only did I get to my feet and feel alive and excited and happy and healthy for the first time in years, but very strange things were happening. My senses were exquisitely heightened. It felt like I had panoramic vision, as if I could see out of the back of my head. I was having this crazy mystical sensation of feeling that I was at one with the waves, and it was a really deep sensation. And these feelings were so powerful and so strong and so pleasurable that I ended up catching four more waves that day, five waves in total. And after those five waves, I wasn't just tired, I was disassembled. They had to put me back in the car, and they drove me home, and I couldn't walk again for 14 days, and people actually had to bring me food because I couldn't make it to my kitchen. But on the 15th day, which was the day that I felt better and I could walk around again, I got back into my car and I went back to the ocean and I did it again. And over the course of about five to six to seven months, when the only thing I was doing differently in my life was surfing, and the other things I was doing in my life were lying on my couch and moaning a lot, I started to feel better, a lot better. Over this period of six months, I went from roughly 10% functionality up to about 70 or 80% functionality. And first of all, I wanted to know what the hell was going on with me. Because surfing, as you know, is not a standard cure for chronic autoimmune conditions. <laughs> Worse, I kept having these quasi-mystical experiences up in the waves. Now, my background is as a, as a science writer. I'm a hardcore rational materialist, and I don't really have mystical experiences. The only time Lyme is fatal is if it gets into your brain. And I was absolutely certain that what was going on with me was the result of the lime getting into my brain and that I was slowly dying, even though I was feeling better. So I ended up embarking on a quest to figure out 
what the heck was going on with me. And in trying to answer these questions, and we'll talk about those answers in a moment, I stumbled upon an astounding underground tradition, a 130-year-old DIY undertaking, a do-it-yourself undertaking. I think it's arguably the greatest DIY conspiracy in history. And this is the epic quest to hack ultimate human performance. What you're looking at is a more modern example of this tradition. This is an experiment run by Baylor neuroscientist David Eagleman, who wanted to find out if time slows down during life-threatening situations. I want to tell you that yes, time does slow down in life-saving situations, and I was hoisted about 150 feet and dropped into a circus net, and it took about six months of chiropractic work till I could walk again when this was over. This is only one example. There are literally millions more. And to put this in context a little bit, I want to give you a little bit of history. I want to talk about a couple of key figures in this tradition. The tradition dates back to 1871, when the man on the right, Albert Heim, Heim was a geologist, member of the Oxford Royal Society, a man who would go on to do fundamental work on the structure of the Alps. But in his younger days, in his early 20s, actually five days before his first Oxford lecture, he went mountaineering in Switzerland with his brother and a few friends. He was climbing the Sandus, which is the 12th highest peak in Switzerland, and he fell off the side of the mountain. He literally fell down a 70-foot cliff. And the time he was in the air lasted only a couple of seconds. But that was not Heim's experience. In between the time he started falling and the time he actually landed, he felt that time, too, slowed down. His senses were also exquisitely heightened. He believed he heard heavenly music. And the most dominant feature of his fall was a massive increase in mental acuity. He actually said later that he felt he could pay, fill an 80-page notebook with all the clear crystal thoughts that floated through his head during this period. Well, he landed, and he survived the fall, and the events moved him profoundly. So he, not knowing what else to do, he decided to make a study of these experiences. So he interviewed 35 other climbers, all who had survived near fatal falls. All of them reported experiences very, very similar to his own. In 1892, he wrote this up, and he published it in a book called Remarks on Fatal Falls. It is the first recorded instance that shows that High-risk activity can alter states of consciousness and enhance mental performance. A few years later, William James, who was a Harvard physician, philosopher, and psychologist, and sort of the godfather of American psychology, got interested in this topic. James, at that point, was doing two things. First of them, he was doing a lot of psychedelics, primarily nitrous oxide, some mescaline. He was also studying the world's religious traditions. He was very, very interested in profound spiritual experiences. And what James noticed is it didn't matter what drug he was taking or what spiritual experience he was talking about. They all shared characteristics very similar to what Albert Heim described, with a key difference. Heim's fall took place in midair. So while his mental faculties were magnificently heightened, there wasn't a whole lot he could do with his body at that point because he was just falling. James figured out that it wasn't just mental acuity that was heightened by this altered state of consciousness. It was also our physical performance. Then in 1915, one of James's students, a physiologist named Walter Bradford Cannon, who was also at Harvard, discovered the fight or flight response. We've all heard these stories. Crisis situation, a woman lifts a car off a baby. This is the flight or flight response. It's the enhanced strength that shows up in a crisis situation. The fight or flight response is a global response by the nervous system to danger. It heightens strength, increases endurance. But the discovery of the fight or flight response was a big deal. It literally rewrote the rule book on human performance. Until that moment, human performance, if you wanted to accelerate human performance, it was a gift from the gods. It was divine in origin. If you wanted to write a better sonnet, you had to talk to the muses. If you wanted a better time in the 100-yard dash, well, Hermes could help. But Cannon's discovery turned a gift from the gods into biology. And the key difference, biology was hackable. In the 1940s, the next member of this tradition is Abraham Maslow. At that point in time, most of psychology was focused on fixing pathological problems. But Maslow was interested in psychological possibilities. He was interested in extremely successful people. 
So we started studying exemplars of outstanding human performance. Albert Einstein, Eleanor Roosevelt, people along those lines. What he was looking for was common traits and common circumstances. He wanted to explain why these people could attain such unbelievable heights while so many others continued to flounder. High achievers, Maslow came to see, were intrinsically motivated. They were deeply committed to testing their limits to stretching potential, and they frequently used intensely focused activity for the, exactly this purpose. But that focused activity, Maslow noticed, produced a significant reward of its own. It altered consciousness. It created experiences very similar to those that William James had started calling mystical experiences, <clears throat> except there was a key difference. Very few of Maslow's subjects were religious, so he secularized James's ter terminology. Mystical experiences were out, peak experiences were in. The sensation, though, was the same. The last stop on this historical tour is in the 1970s, when the University of Chicago psychologist Mihaly Csikszentmihalyi embarked on what is now considered the largest global happiness study ever undertaken. Though at the time, we didn't have happiness studies. That was kind of a silly idea, so we didn't call it that. But what Csikszentmihalyi was interested in and what he was asking people is about the times in their life when they felt the be their best and they performed their best. And he asked a lot of people. He started out talking to experts, surgeons, chess players, dancers, rock climbers, and then he expanded from there. He talked to Detroit assembly line workers, Navajo sheep herders, elderly Korean women, young Japanese teenage motorcycle gang members. It didn't really matter. It didn't matter who he talked to. What Csikszentmihalyi discovered was the happiest people on earth are the people who had the most of Maslow's peak experience, except he had an even better term. He called these experiences flow states because in everybody he talked to, flow was the sensation conferred. In flow, every action, every decision leads effortlessly, fluidly, seamlessly to the next. It's like playing jazz. Now in flow, what actually happens is concentration is extremely, extremely focused. So focused that action and awareness begin to merge. Our sense of self, our sense of self-consciousness disappears. Time gets very strange. It either speeds up so five hours will pass by in an instant, five minutes, or it slows down and it creeps by. If you've ever experienced awe or have been in a car crash, that is what happens to time and flow. <clears throat> and of course, in flow states, performance goes through the roof, really through the roof. Flow is now described as an optimal state of consciousness, a state where we perform our best and feel our best. It is a transformation available to anyone, anyone, anywhere, provided certain initial conditions are met. Researchers now believe that flow sits at the heart of almost every athletic championship, accounts for significant progress in the arts, and underpins most major scientific breakthroughs. World leaders, Bill Clinton, Tony Blair, have sung the praises of flow states. Fortune 500 companies like Toyota and Patagonia have built their corporate philosophies around the state. And from a quality of life perspective, psychologists are clear, the people who have the most flow in their lives are the happiest people on earth. Flow amplifies physical skills. In flow, we are faster, we are stronger, we are more agile and more dexterous, but so are our brains. During flow, our senses are taking in more information, we're processing it more deeply, and while there's still some debate about this, we may be processing it much more quickly. But flow does more than just boost information processing. It jacks up pattern recognition. It amplifies future prediction. Many of the fundamental neuronal processes in the, are amplified by flow. As a result, flow significantly boosts intellectual performance. It amps up decision making, creativity. It drives innovation and breakthroughs. For these reasons, flow is becoming increasingly significantly important to business. In a recent article for Forbes, James Slavitt, who is a VC with Greylock Partners, called flow state percentage, which is the amount of time one's employees spend in flow, the most important management metric for building great innovation, innovation teams. There are a lot of reasons this is true. I don't have time to talk about all of them. I want to talk about one for a little bit longer. One, a, there is a version of flow known as group flow, which is what happens when a group of people get into flow state together. 
The term was coined by University of Washington and St. Louis psychologist Keith Sawyer to describe what happens with improv jazz musicians and improv comedians when they all find their groove, when creativity jacks up, when performance graph jacks up, and there is a whole greater than the sum of its parts effect. But again, group flow doesn't, isn't just for comedians, it isn't just for musicians. In a recent study done with over 300 professionals at a petrochemical company, a government agency, and a strategy consulting firm, group flow, the, excuse me, the highest performers at all organizations were the people with the most group flow in their lives. To give you another example, McKinsey just conducted a 10-year study on peak performance and top executives. They found that top executives in flow are five times more productive than out of flow. They realized that if we could increase the amount all of us are in flow by a mere 20%, overall workplace productivity would double. That's pretty amazing. There is, of course, some bad news. Most people spend very, very little time in flow. Some people never get there at all. Flow might be one of the most desirable states on Earth, but it's also one of the most elusive. Seekers have spent centuries trying, and no one has found a reliable way to repeat the experience. A bigger issue has been measurability. These are very subjective experiences. Until recently, there wasn't a great way of studying them. Chick sent me high back in the 70s and the 80s to get around this problem, gave people pagers. And he would page them eight, nine, 10 times a day. Hi, are you in flow? <laughs> if, they, if they happened to be in flow when he called, they weren't afterwards, that's for sure. <laughs> the data was fuzzy. The researchers were balkanized. When I began this work, I was looking, I was hoping to find an organization that had pulled all these disparate pieces together. It didn't exist. So myself and several colleagues had to start one. The result is the Flow Genome Project. We're an interdisciplinary organization dedicated to reverse engineering the genome of flow. I'm not going to talk about this much right now because my partner, Jamie Wheel, is sitting over there, who's the executive director of the Flow Genome Project, is going to be doing a breakout session a little later today, and we'll cover what we're exactly doing a little more thoroughly. What I do want to say is we're taking advantage of two key developments. The first is a measurement revolution. There has been a revolution in neural imaging technology, as most of you know, fMRI, SPECT, MEG. All these things allow us to peer into the human brain like never before. Simultaneously, there's been a revolution in quantified self devices, like the Nike Fuel Band. These allow us to track these states like never before. The second development is in data sets. Flow might be the most elusive state on Earth. Most people might never get there. But there is a completely overlooked subculture, or a marginalized subculture for that matter, who are accessing these states far, far more than most. Those are action and adventure sport athletes. Here's why. In all other activities, flow might be the hallmark of exceptional performance. But in situations where the slightest error could be fatal, then perfection is the only choice, and flow is the only guarantee of perfection. Thus, flow is the only way to survive the life-threatening situations of the big waves, big mountains, and big rivers. When it comes to the upper edge of these sports, the choice is very stark. It's flow or die. As a result of this, action and adventure sport athletes have become very, very, very good at harnessing flow states. In fact, they're probably better than just about anybody else in the history of the world. How good have they become? If you strip out the glamour, if you slip out the gnar, and you just look at action and adventure sports as a data set, what you see over the previous generation is nearly exponential growth in ultimate human performance. That's performance when life or limb is on the line. Nothing like this has ever happened before. Sports performance, athletic performance, human performance in general, it's governed by evolution. It is slow, it is steady. When you plot it on a graph, it is linear. Performance does not quintuple five times, does not quintuple in 15 years. But that's exactly what's happening in action and adventure sports. This very unlikely collection of men and women have pushed human performance faster and farther than in other, any other point in the history of our species. In what is an evolutionary eye blank, they have used flow to 
completely re redefine the limits of the possible. I want to give you an example of the kind of progression I'm talking about. Surfing is a sport that dates back to about 400 BC. So in the 600 years it's been around, from the birth of surfing to roughly 1992, the largest wave anybody had ever surfed was 25 feet. The reason for this is simple physics. To catch a wave, you have to paddle to roughly the speed of the wave. Waves, big waves, move 25 to 35 to 40 miles an hour, and there is absolutely no way a guy lying on his stomach on his board can paddle at 40 miles an hour. To get around this problem, in the early 90s, Laird Hamilton, Buzzy Kerbox, and a handful of other maverick surfers invented the sport of tow in surfing. They put a tow rope behind a jet ski, and they used the jet ski to accelerate them into the waves so their speed could match the speed of the wave. Now, using this technique, in the past 25 years, they have taken the height of waves surfed from 25 feet up to 100 feet. The first 100-foot wave was surfed a couple weeks ago. This by itself is astounding. The very wave that toe surfing was invented is a wave called Jaws. You're looking at a picture of it. It's in Maui. It's the wave that was so big, that was so ferocious, they had to invent an entirely new sport to find a way to surf it. And that was true until 2011, when this man, Ian Walsh, figured out how to paddle into Jaws. What you are looking at is the first wave he surfed. He paddled, it's a 55-foot wave that he managed to paddle himself into. In that moment, in this instance, he inverted 600 years of surf wisdom and defied the laws of physics. He is literally doing the impossible. So I want to talk a little bit more about how he's doing the impossible and why he's doing the possible. And I want to talk about this, what this revolution in measurement technology has taught us about flow. There's a lot going on in the body and the brain during flow, and I don't have nearly enough time to cover all of it. So we're going to talk about two things primarily today. We're going to talk about neurochemistry, and we're going to talk about neuroanatomy. And I'm going to start with neurochemistry. Flow is a cascade of neurochemicals in the brain. It starts out as a combination of norepinephrine and dopamine. Both of these are focusing mechanisms. They jack up pattern recognition. They help you focus. They enhance muscle reaction times as well. You also get anadamine. Anadamine boosts lateral thinking, thinking outside the box. You get endorphins, which are pain-relieving drugs and that enhance social bonding. And you get serotonin, which is the common chemical that underpins the Prozac revolution. Now, for those of you who don't understand what these chemicals do, each of them has a drug analog. Cocaine is widely considered to be the most addictive drug on Earth. All that happens when you snort cocaine is the brain releases massive quantities of dopamine. Norepinephrine is what you get from speed. Anadamine is the psychoactive in marijuana. Endorphins are opiates, and serotonin is either ecstasy or LSD, depending on the pathway it takes in the brain. The point is that if you were to try to cocktail these drugs on the street, you'd end up drooling or dead. Flow allows the brain to do it naturally with none of the downside and all of the upside. But what this means is that the state that underpins ultimate human performance is one of the most addictive states on Earth, arguably the most addictive state on Earth. Psychologists, of course, don't like the word addictive. It has negative connotations. They prefer autotelic. When something is autotelic, it is an end in itself. What it means is people will seek out flow states for the sheer sake of doing it, even at great personal expense. Now, there's a dark flip side to all of this. Take a look at these stats. The story behind each of them comes down to people trying to alter their mood and enhance their performance, or both. Now, consider that the primary illicit drug of choice is marijuana. That triggers the release of anadamine, which you get naturally in flow. Antidepressants and the stimulants in question, stimulants are ADH drug, ADHD drugs primarily, combine some variation of dopamine, norepinephrine, and serotonin. Again, things that show up naturally in flow. And the major prescription drug of abuse are opioids, like OxyContin. These release endorphins. In other words, Americans are literally killing themselves trying to achieve artificially what flow gives us naturally. Now I want to jump back to the spontaneous healing that I experienced. Another thing that flow does is it 
boosts the immune system. The neurochemicals I've been talking about all drive up the immune system, and they also calm down the nervous system. They, I think of them as resetting the nervous system to zero. Lyme disease is an autoimmune disease. It means that my nervous system was massively, massively inflamed. Resetting it to zero made an enormous difference. But I want to also tell you that it's not just me, and it's not just humans. My wife and I are co-founders and run a dog sanctuary known as Rancho de Chihuahua. We work with small dogs with big problems. Hospice care for the aged, special needs care for special needs dogs. All of our dogs come to us directly from a vet. They usually come in dire straits with dire warnings. Three weeks to live, a month at most. Our dogs live for years. In the picture that you're looking at, at least five of these dogs, these are dogs that were supposed to be dead within a few months that we've gotten them, are now over the age of 20 which is a very, very long life for animals, even chihuahuas. Now I want to jump to neural anatomy and talk about what actually happens in the brain. So in flow, the extrinsic system, which is essentially your conscious mind, is coming offline. In the intrinsic system, your unconscious mind is taking over. How this happens comes down to something called transient hypofrontality. Hypo is H-Y-P-O, means to slow down. It's the opposite of hyper. And the thing that is slowing down or shutting down or shutting off completely during flow is your prefrontal cortex. Prefrontal cortex is where most of your higher cognitive functions are housed. This is where you do most of your thinking. It's where your morality is. It's where your will is. In flow, it shuts down. For example, the moment action and awareness merge, that's actually your superior frontal gyrus winking out. <coughs> When self-consciousness goes away, that's the dorsal lateral prefrontal cortex. The dorsal lateral prefrontal cortex does a lot of things. One of the things it does is provide you with your inner critic. So in flow, when people talk about a sense of freedom and liberation and creativity escalating, one of the reasons why is because your inner critic has been shut off. Time gets funky in flow because time is calculated almost every place in the brain and definitely every place in the prefrontal cortex. And as parts of your prefrontal cortex shut down, past and future disappear. And you end up living in what psychologists call the elongated now. The experience I talked about earlier that I had in the waves, where I felt one with the, wave, one with the waves, this too was a product of transient hypofrontality. During periods of intense, intense concentration, as happens in meditation, or in the amount of focus you need in action and adventure sports, the hyperfrontality moves from your prefrontal cortex farther back into your lobes. When it hits the right parietal lobe, something very strange happens. The right parietal lobe is the part of your brain that helps separate self from other. It exists to help us navigate the world so we can walk around without bumping into things. People who have a stroke or brain damage to this area, they can't do something as simple as sitting down on a couch because they don't know where their leg ends and the couch begins. Now, during deep, deep concentration, as this part of the brain winks out, this deeper portion of the brain, your limbic system, which is essentially your emotional system, every second or so, millisecond or so, your limbic system asks a bunch of questions. Where am I? What's going on? Those kinds of things. The where am I question goes to the right parietal lobe. But in moments of intense concentration, the right parietal lobe is shut down. So the only answer it can give, because it can no longer separate self from other, is at this particular moment, you really do appear to be one with everything. Now that's a little trickier, because it actually turns out that you're one with whatever you're focusing on. So Franciscan nuns, for example, they focus on Jesus' love when they meditate, and they experience a state known as unia mystica. This is oneness with God's love. Tibetan Buddhists, they focus on the nothingness in the universe. So they become one with everything. They experience absolute unitary being. Surfers become one with the waves. Rock climbers, skiers, snowboarders become one with the mountains. Now I want to tell you what all this stuff adds up into. A very quick shorthand for learning and memory is the more neurochemicals you get during an experience, the more parts of the brain that are active during an experience, the greater chance something gets moved from short-term memory into long-term storage. Flow is a very, very potent response with five of the most powerful neurochemicals the brain can produce. 
it massively increases learning and memory. Now, this has shown up all over the place. In studies of brick and mortar schools, for example, Montessori education, Waldorf education, the high performance that relates to both those are due to the fact that they're built around curriculum that drive people into flow. In 2007, South Korean researchers were looking at e-learning. So that's electronic games and web-based tutorials and things like that. They found a significant correlation between flow and positive learning attitudes and positive learning outcome. The US Defense Department did a recent study, DARPA did it. They were looking at military snipers, and they were using transcranial direct stimulation for any of you who knows what that means. And if you don't, it basically means they shot a big magnetic wave into the brain, and they induced kind of a rough version of transient hypo hypofrontality. Using this, they found the amount of time it teaches, tar it, it took them to teach target acquisition skills to snipers was cut by a factor of 2.3. In another study, run also with snipers, using biofeedback to put people in the flow, they found the amount of time it takes for a novice marksman to become an expert sniper was reduced by 50%. Now, all of this helps explain the near exponential growth in ultimate human performance we've seen over the past few decades. So I want to talk a little bit about why these action and adventure sport athletes have hacked flow better than other people. And the first thing you need to know is that it really wasn't entirely intentional. If you want to hack flow, you need to hack the attention system. And action and adventure sports are great for that. Action and adventure sports athletes rely on external triggers. These are triggers in the environment that drive people into flow. I'm going to talk about three in particular. High consequences is the obvious first one. Mortal consequences are a fantastic, fantastic focusing mechanism. When you're playing in the no-fall zone, you don't get to phone it in. Deep embodiment is the next one. In deep embodiment, it means you're fully in your body and fully aware of your body. 50% of our nerve endings are in our hands, our feet, and our face. Deep embodiment means we're paying attention to all these information feeds. Rich environment means lots of novelty, lots of complexity, and lots of unpredictability. This is the exact opposite of office workers in their cubicle farms. This is actually the exact opposite of most other professional athletes who train and play in climate-controlled, hyper-manicured superdomes. Once these external triggers start producing flow in these athletes' lives, because the state is so addictive, they start relying on internal triggers. Now, these are triggers that are internal to the activity itself or their attitude to the activity. Three in particular. There's a challenge skills ladder. What this means is that the challenge must exceed the skills by a slight percentage number. It's actually, 4% is the exact sweet spot. You need clear goals. This aligns task with belief and always lets you know where you're going next. And you need immediate feedback so you can course correct in real time. Now, these are fairly ordinary categories but they produce a fairly remarkable result. They drive us, they force us into the present moment. Think about this for a little bit. How many of you have been completely present during this lunch for my speech? Have you been paying attention the entire time? Have you been daydreaming, checking your email, flirting with your neighbor, wondering about the next bathroom break? When these internal flow triggers are engaged, that kind of wandering mind just isn't possible. Something else that these athletes have done better than almost anybody else is recognize that flow is not just one state. It's not just a state of heightened performance. It's actually a four-stage process, and not all the stages are particularly pleasurable. Flow starts with what's known as struggle. This is the first phase in the flow state. This is a learning and loading phase. We are essentially overloading the brain with information. We are bringing ourselves to the brink of frustration. This is followed by the release phase. This is a moment of relaxation. You literally have to take your mind completely off what it is that you've been struggling with. When this happens, nitric oxide, which is a global signaling molecule in the body, is released. This reduces stress hormones that were jacked up during the struggle phase and replaces it with the positive neurochemicals that show up in flow and thus triggers the third state, which is the flow state. The flow state rolls right into a fourth state. This is a learning and memory consolidation phase. 
But the thing to remember here is that flow is neurochemically expensive to produce. You're using up the brain supply of feel-good neurochemicals. So in this last phase, you tend to be a little down. What this means is that even if you wanted to get back into a peak state immediately, you can't. Now this is where athletes have a real advantage. When you go out, when you put your life on the line, there's a natural tendency afterwards to chill out, take a couple days off. Now compare this to the rest of us. When we're in peak states, knowledge workers, we want to keep things red lines. We have deadlines. We don't want to slow down. We, some of us can't afford to slow down. But the truth of the matter is pushing harder to get to greater since it's exactly the opposite direction. So I want to be clear, kind of summing all this up. What's being presented here is an alternative path to mastery. Right now, we sort of have a Protestant work ethic view of expertise. Struggle now, salvation later. Flow states invert this rule. This is literally a hedonic path to mastery. We are daisy chaining a string of autotelic nows to turbocharge performance. But we can't kid ourselves. This requires fierce, fierce, fierce commitment. To get the results we're seeing in action and adventure sports world means doing what they did, it means redesigning their lives and their culture around flow. But if we can harden this, this knowledge, we can apply it across all domains in society. We can apply it in healthcare, in education, in the organizations we lead and serve. The exact same revolution that is going on in action and adventure sports world can be going on anywhere. The data is clear. Flow is the very thing that makes us come alive. It is the mystery. It is the point. I want to put it this another way. During this talk, I described some difficult and dangerous activities. People involved are highly trained professionals. So please, please, please try them at home. Because what the world needs most is Superman. It's time to rise. Thank you much.